So I'd like to welcome uh, our next speaker, Kendall Johnson, to the podium. Uh, Kendall's a graduate researcher with the Evenov Lab uh, on Northeastern's campus, uh, which specializes in very sensitive separatory um, methods for low input samples. Uh, Kendall specializes in capillary electrophoresis developments for uh, top down and bottom up proteomic sample preparations. Uh, and for her work in this area, she has recently won an EAS Graduate Student Researcher Award in 2020. Uh, and I think today she's going to be discussing um, or contrasting liquid chromatography and capillary electrophoresis separatory methods, uh, which is a lot of, uh, is of primary interest to a lot of us who typically use liquid chromatography. So it's going to be really neat to see what we're missing out on by just sticking to that separatory mechanism. Uh, so with that, welcome you to the stage. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thank you, Gray. Uh, for that kind introduction and thank you Nikolai and to everyone um, who put together this conference. I know it's been a difficult year for conferences, but it's really nice to have this hybrid model. Um, so some of us can come together, but still many people can participate. Um, as Grace said, I'm going to talk about some of my CEMS methods that I've been using for uh, bottom up proteomics. Um, so just a very quick outline. I'll go over the method overview of what method I'm using. And then I'll, as Ray mentioned, discuss some of the advantages of CE and comparing my data with some data acquired by LC methods. And then show some data that we've collected with a miniaturized sample preparation of low input HeLa cells. So uh, firstly, just to outline the CE method that I'm using, uh, I use a bare pusillific capillary with the sheathless ESI interface. This is commercially available. Um, and so the image here depicts the, the sheathless interface that I'm using. And I'm coupling, for all of the data shown here, coupling with a uh, fusion LUMOS mass spectrometer where I'm doing ion trap MS2s. Uh, I show several base peak electrophorograms here just to show the reproducibility that I'm able to get with the method that I'm using. Um, so this is for replicate analysis of HeLa, um, just a bottom up uh, HeLa digest analysis. Um, so as many of you know, CE is an orthogonal separation method uh, compared to reverse phase liquid chromatography. And so I've used some of the data that I've collected and data that my colleagues have collected using reverse phase chromatography to show exactly that. So on the uh, upper left of the slide here, I've shown this is my data um, with a gradient based on the net charge of the peptides uh, in respect to the migration time. So you can see more basic peptides are migrating faster and the more acidic peptides migrate slower. Whereas from the reverse phase data, so this is two different, sorry, two different LC methods where I have a uh, bead packed, which is a 75 micron uh, column and also a monolithic column that my colleague is uh, working with as well. And here the gravy index, which shows the hydrophobic hydrophobicity scores of the peptides shows that the elution in reverse phase LC, which is based on hydrophobicity, as most of you know. Um, and really what we can see when we compare the data from similar inputs of this in analyzed by CE and analyzed by reverse phase LC is a complementarity, especially at the level of the peptide groups that are identified, where 5,000 peptides are uniquely identified in the CEMS method. So digging into what those 5,000 peptides are, that what, what's different about them where they're identified in CE and not by reverse phase LC, um, I see that's typically modifications that are uh, changing the net charge of the, pro of the peptide such as phosphorylation and acetylation, cause a change in electrophoretic mobility, which increases the migration time of the peptides, such that they migrate later than the bulk of other peptides, which is very helpful in analyzing these types of peptides, because as you can see um, from this figure on the right, 
the peptides with acetylation or phosphorylation modifications are typically at least an order of magnitude lower than many of the other peptides that we're collecting in this data set. And just a reminder, there are no sample enrichment strategies that I've used um, in this data. So in the comparison of peptides that have phosphorylation and acetylation modifications from uh, comparing CE to LC, we see much higher identification of phosphorylated and acetylated peptides in the CEMS data set using a HeLa digest standard, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, additionally, looking at oh, sorry, some other um, peptide qualities that are causing some sort of migration trend in CE, I've noticed that the number of peptides with one or more miscleavage sites is much higher in the CEMS data set. And sorry, um, this ion map shows the, the peptide map here shows that um, most of these are migrating earlier in the migration time, which is expected as these peptides will typically be more basic. So after doing the comparison and uh, showing all of you some of the advantages and benefits of using CE, we wanted to go even lower in the sample input amount uh, so the brown bars here is what's shown in the comparison analysis, and we went um, down to sub nanogram, even down to uh, 88 picogram injection amount, and this is using a HeLa digest standard. Um, and we saw uh, pretty good coverage with the thousand proteins. These are not quantified; uh, these are just identified. A thousand proteins being identified from less than a nanogram of protein standard, and um, Phosphorylation and acetylation modifications are also picked up from these low input data sets. So we wanted to test not using a bulk standard, but actually from processing low numbers of cells. So in my lab, we do not currently have access to a cell in one um, instrument or anything where we're actually um, processing single cells. So we're trying to do very low cell aliquots, which would be representative of if you had a very limited sample that you wanted to work with. So what we've done is we've cultured HeLa cells and prepared aliquots of um, 500 and 1,000 cells, lysed, reduced, and digested these all in the same vial, skipping desalting steps and resuspending and injecting from the same vial where all the processing was occurred, similar to the way that the nanopods strategy is used to reduce sample loss and um, give us uh, the best shot at um, seeing a high number of proteins. So there are some concerns with skipping desalting. Um, this is an ion density map, which is just showing the, some of the buffer components which are highly abundant, which we, at least in this uh, case, can separate from the majority of the peptides. So this is a peptide migration window. Although some of these buffer components do co-migrate with peptides, which is of concern, and that's something that we're looking into ways to mitigate. But from these analysis where in CE, we're injecting very low volumes. So even from these 500 and 1,000 cell preparations, we're injecting single cell, five cell, 10 cell equivalents, um, just to see this the sensitivity of the method um, that we've been working with. And from 10 cells, we get about 1,000 proteins. And at the single cell level, um, these are triplicate analyses of a single replicate. Um, I see around 400 proteins, which I have a, a nice standard deviation from triplicate injections. However, I noticed that when doing the analysis at a single cell level, the first injection always had the highest number of proteins, which dropped off quite significantly after that analysis. Um, this is about a, an hour and a half between each injection. 
Um, so we believe that significant sample loss is occurring, likely due to absorption of peptides to the walls or the plastic vials that we're using for injection. So when we when I average biological replicates, so this is three different cell aliquots that were processed, single cell equivalent injections, I get actually a higher protein amount. And still we're looking at the modified peptides that we're able to see at these low cell inputs, um, where acetylated peptides we're able to see um, around 100 to 200 at the single cell level, and even more with just a few more cells. And phosphorylated peptides uh, are lower, um, but at the level of five cells or 10 cells can still be moderately profiled. So additionally, I looked into um, different ways of processing the data to see if we can get more out of it. Um, I know some people have mentioned, you know, using PD 2.5, which has some newer nodes and processing algorithms. Uh, so we've used the inferior rescoring node which is the orange bar here. And that shows an improvement at all cell equivalent injection levels. And we've also used the bionic algorithm to process our data. Um, now to note, all of this data is filtered for less than or equal to 1% FDR. Um, bionic just has a separate way of filtering the data with high confidence and medium confidence. Um, but these are all still within 1% FDR. I'm just reporting both. Um, because we're able to discern from that, that data set uh, between high and medium confidence. Bionic, which is also um, has published about their uh, modification, fine control um, feature that they're able to uh, profile modified peptides really well gives us a boost in identifications of phosphorylated and acetylated peptides at all cell levels to the point where we're able to see um, from a single cell between 20 and 60 phosphopeptides. So to conclude, um, I'm showing the advantages that CEMS has for profiling post-translational modifications and that we are able to identify an average of around 400 proteins and 1,400 peptide groups from single cell equivalent injections. Uh, these protein and peptide identifications, however, will drop, and we have seen that they drop by 63% and 54% respectively after the first injection, um, which is likely due to a time-dependent sample loss um, from absorption of uh, peptides to the vials. Um, protein and peptide identifications can be increased with inferior rescoring or bionic search algorithm and limited sample profiling of phosphorylated and acetylated peptides can be enhanced using bionic search algorithms. So I'd like to acknowledge my team in the Ivanov lab, uh, particularly James Costas, who helped with the sample processing in this work and my colleague Mikhail Gregus, who collected all of the LC data. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Very nice work. I think people have been trying to couple reproducibly CE and mass spec for at least 30 years. So if you can do that, that's, that's great. Uh, I had a question regarding your sample loss. What are you storing your samples in? And that's what plastic and what's the buffer? So the, the plastic vials that I'm using are um, low bind PCR tubes, which we actually purchased from the from SIEX, the company that we're using their CEMS instrument. Um, and the buffer that I use is uh, ammonium acetate. So I know it's not perfect and we've tried to find other ways to inject from maybe glass or um, other things that we're looking into or adding things like organic or passivating the vials potentially to prevent some of these losses. Uh, but if you have anyone who has other ideas, um, 
I've got one. Yeah. So the nice thing about CE is you move charge around, as you just said. So you can actually use detergents if they're the different polarity. So you can actually include a detergent in there, which will completely occupy the sites of all uh, adsorption surfaces that will be there. Now, you'll have to be careful if you're using the same auto inject for other system systems, uh, but that is a very viable option and, and it's worked before. The other thing you can consider is putting it in a kaotrope, which if it's not charged like urea, uh, also prevents adsorption. Um, great, thank you, for, thank you for the advice. Uh, so we have a question from Zoom from Ben. Uh, I may have missed it. What is the mass analyzer on CE? The mass analyzer that I'm using? Um, so I'm using the Fusion Lumos for Orbit Trap, but I'm actually using Ion Trap MS2. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Uh, do we have additional audience questions? All right, Kendall, thank you so much. It's uh, really, really inspiring to see the ability to uh, identify PTMs in an unenriched sample alongside unmodified um, peptides. It's something that you know we look for in our own data and very cool to see as an application. Uh, so thank you so much for your talk. Thank you.